Well, today's message is a, a message of hope, just like the songs that we've sung. It's the season of hope. And it's a message of knowing that there will always be hope. So please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. And I'll be reading verses 21 and 22. I'll read from the ESV version, but I've borrowed some words from the NIV and the NASB version to use them where I think it makes the wording a little bit easier to understand. So Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets testify to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction. May God bless the reading of his word. The main point of this passage of scripture is the Apostle Paul's announcement that there is now a righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, no matter who they are. That means there is now a hope of salvation for those who are unable to live a perfect, sinless life, and that means all of us. If you understand that, then you pretty much have got the gist of today's sermon. But I do hope you'll stay and listen to the details. The outline I'll use today for unfolding this incredible, beautiful meaning behind this passage of Scripture is as follows. One, what is the righteousness of God that has now been revealed apart from the law? And two, how do the Old Testament law and the prophets testify to this righteousness of God that has now been revealed apart from the law? And why is this important? And three, what is the significance of the phrase, there is no distinction? So that's the outline. But first I'll, I'll look at the context into which this passage of Scripture has been placed. And this can be found in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, all the way through to verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. And that's a lot of reading. <laughs> so to save time, I, I've summarized this as follows. Unrighteous people suppress the truth about God and exchange the glory of God for images, images of the creation. They do things that they should not do, and they deserve to die because they have no excuse. Those who received God's law through Moses dishonor God by breaking the law of Moses. And those who did not receive the law through Moses are condemned by their own consciousness because God has written his law on their hearts. Paul wrote Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through to chapter 3, verse 20, to stop the mouths of all humanity and to bring the whole world into accountability for their sin and to know that they would be righteously judged by God. That's the context. That's the background. And coming out from that background, today's reading gives us hope when it says that now there is a righteousness of God that has been revealed through faith in Jesus Christ, apart from the law for all who believe. So now to answer the question, what is the righteousness of God that has been revealed now apart from the law? It's important to first understand that now is the current time period in which we're living. The time period in which we're currently living began when Jesus introduced the new covenant. As recorded in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the new covenant was Jesus sealed in his own blood. Under the old covenant, God required perfect obedience to the law, whether it was the law of Moses that he gave to the Jews 
or it was the law that's written on the heart that he gave to the Gentiles. God required perfect obedience to his law. Therefore, lawbreakers were punished. It would be unrighteous for God to not punish lawbreakers. Most people agree, wrongdoing should be punished. For example, if someone steals my car, most people would agree that the thief should be punished. And most people would agree that and would be outraged if a judge allowed the thief to go free without being punished. I say that, but maybe, I don't, I don't really want to digress, but maybe there's more than just a few people today who would not be outraged if a judge refused to punish a thief who stole my car. I think we're witnessing a changing of the tide in society today. Respect for God and love and respect for neighbor just seems to be going out with the tide. I think there could be a noticeable number of people today who believe in some sort of a karma-like way that I deserve to have my car stolen. And they believe it would be right to let the thief go unpunished. I think there are people today, there are some people who would believe that. At least until their own car got stolen. Anyway, the case that the Apostle Paul carefully explained in the verses leading up to our reading today describes the hopelessness of those who are doomed to fail in their efforts to perfectly obey God's law under the terms of the Old Covenant. That was then. That was the Old Covenant. This is now. From verse 21 of our reading and onwards, the Apostle Paul is writing from the view of the New Covenant, the New Covenant that was sealed by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Now, the righteousness of God that has been revealed is the righteousness that comes through faith in the work that Christ accomplished in his life, in his death on the cross, and in his resurrection. So that's to say, the righteousness that comes through belief that on our behalf, Christ lived the perfect life that we should have lived, and he died the death that we should have died as punishment for our sins. And he paid the penalty for our sins with his own blood. And by raising him from the dead, God proved that his sacrifice was acceptable. True believers. That's what Jesus did for you and me. That's what he did out of love for those who were to believe on him for eternal life. But more importantly, that's what Jesus did out of love for his Father. By offering himself to be punished for our sins, Jesus upheld God's righteousness because our sins were not allowed to go unpunished. And Jesus upheld God's eternal steadfast love because by bearing the wrath of God for us, he saved us from eternal damnation. That great incomprehensible sacrifice was made by Jesus Christ to uphold both his Father's love and his righteousness. By the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, God is vindicated. That means God is proved to be both righteous and loving. Jesus died for our sins, and his life of perfect obedience to God is credited to us. There's no longer any record of wrongs held against us. And now, when God looks upon us, he sees the righteousness of his Son, which has been given to us. That's how God's righteousness is revealed, apart from the law. God is both just, because he did not allow sin to go unpunished, and he is the justifier, because he himself bore our punishment through the sacrifice of his one and only Son on the cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God 
the Son of Man. And all of this is a free gift of grace to us that is realized by believers through faith, which is also a free gift. Let's just pause for a moment and let all of that sink in. Now let's look at the next question. How did the law and the prophets testify to the righteousness of God that is now revealed apart from the law? That sounds like a contradiction. The law testifies to something that's apart from the law. How can this be? Well, first of all, what's the law? In simple terms, the law is made up of the Ten Commandments and the other commandments and regulations that God gave to Moses for governing the day-to-day -day life of the Israelites. God gave the law to the children of Israel twice. The first giving of the law is recorded in the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus tells us how God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, along with the other commandments and regulations. And in Exodus, the Lord declared that the guilty, those who did not keep the law, would not go unpunished. That's what it tells us in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 7. The second giving of the law is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy means the second law. But this doesn't mean that the book of De Deuteronomy contains a new law or another law. It contains the same law, but explained in more detail. And in that detail is the answer to our question. How did the law testify to a righteousness of God apart from the law? In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses reads out to the children of Israel the law for the second time. And in chapter 30, he sets before them both a blessing and a curse, a blessing for obedience to the law and a curse for disobedience. And then he says this in chapter 30, verses 11 to 14. This is the commandment that I command you today, and it is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven and bring it to us so that we can do it? And it's not beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea and bring it to us that we should hear it and do it? But the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Now where is the explanation that shows us that these verses testify to a righteousness that exists apart from the law? The Apostle Paul gives that explanation to us in chapter 10 of the book of Romans. Verses 11 to 14 of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, are repeated by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 to 13, where he says, Moses writes about a righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. 
For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. That's the gospel. But verses 6 and 7 of this passage in Romans chapter 10 are hard to be understood. I'll repeat them. The righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. As you can see, the Apostle Paul does not repeat word for word what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now John Piper has pointed out that Paul essentially substituted the words about Christ for the parts of the verses where Moses used the words, who, who will bring this to us that we may hear it and do it? In other words, who will help us to do this? Who will help us to perfectly obey this law that's impossible to perfectly obey? And who will help us to obtain forgiveness for our sins when we sin by not perfectly obeying this law? Christ will. So to emphasize the meaning of this, I've paraphrased these verses, and I've inserted more detail about the work of Christ into the paraphrasing using the insight provided by John Piper, and the result is the, re the verses read something like this. The righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring this way of perfect obedience to us that we may hear it and do it. Christ will. He will come down to us from heaven to be born of a virgin, to live as a human, and live the life of perfect obedience to God that we should have lived. He will do this on our behalf. And do not say in your heart, who will go over the sea for us and bring to us this way of obtaining forgiveness for our sins? Who will do it that we may hear it and do it? Christ will. Christ will pay the penalty for our sins by dying, by dying on the cross in our place. And the worthiness of his sacrifice will be proved when God brings him up from the dead. In other words, these verses from the Old Testament law testify to Christ as the great and sure fulfillment of the law for all who believe. Now this is exciting stuff. This is very exciting. Do you remember the story about the two disciples on their road to Emmaus on their journey? It's told in Luke chapter 24. They had witnessed the crucif crucifixion, and just as they were preparing to take their journey, they heard the report, Christ has risen from the dead. And they were very perplexed. And as they journeyed, Christ himself joined them on their journey. They didn't recognize him. And as they walked along together, Christ opened the scriptures to them, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And when they looked back on this incredible experience, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us? When he talked to us on the road, while well, he opened to us the scriptures. So in our study of the scriptures, these scriptures this morning, with the Holy Spirit inspired interpretation provided by the Apostle Paul, and with a little bit of guidance from John Piper, we have, in a manner of speaking, joined those disciples on that road with Christ and had the scriptures open to us that testify to him. Is your heart burning? Through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, 
we have touched lightly on that incredible impact of Jesus himself interpreting to us the scriptures about things concerning himself. Hearts should be burning. What he has shown us in the scriptures through the Holy Spirit, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. John 14, verse 6. Jesus has paid it all, and all to him we owe. Our hearts should be burning. Can you imagine all of the other things that he shared with those disciples along that road? He would have gone through all the prophecies, all the prophecies that testified about him and how he was to become the righteousness of God that is apart from the law for those who believe. And how did the prophets testify to all of this? Well, we just don't have the time, do we, to go through all the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. But I'll, I'll just illustrate two. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5, 10, and 11. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. I've put this in the King James because it's just got that ring to it, doesn't it? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord, our righteousness. Christ himself is our righteousness apart from the law. But why is this testimony, this testimony from the law and the prophets concerning Christ as our righteousness, why is it so important? It's important because it proves that God knew the end from the beginning. He foretold all of these things, and then he brought them to pass. There's no plan A or plan B with God. Adam's and Eve's fall from grace in the Garden of Eden, that didn't take God by surprise. So to speak, force his hand to come up with an emergency plan to deal with fallen sinners. In a mystery that we will need an eternity to comprehend, God created us in his own image, and he allowed us to be put to the test, and we failed. We fell far short of giving the God the glory that is his alone. But in the saga of human history that God wrote in advance, he pointed the way to Christ, the Savior, Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man. He came and lived a life that we should have lived, a life of perfect obedience. And he died the death that we should have died. And it was always meant to be this way. And he did this while we were yet sinners in order to uphold his Father's righteousness and to demonstrate both his Father's love for us and his own love for us. So what's the significance of the final part of our reading, verse 22, part B, which says, for there is no distinction. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets testify to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. 
In this last piece of verse 22, Paul's pointing out that God makes no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. In the past, through the Jewish nation, God pointed the way to the Messiah. But now the Messiah has appeared. And he isn't a savior just for the Jews. He's a savior for all nations. Now, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation is freely offered to all who will receive it. And there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Now, God commands all people everywhere to repent. It's Acts chapter 17, verse 31. For there's no distinction, because the Apostle Paul goes on to say in that well-known verse, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the last part of Romans chapter 3, verse 22, is really the first part of Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And if I elaborate on it, I'll be stealing someone else's sermon, won't I? But I would like to conclude by taking this concept of no distinction just a little bit further. In his other writings, the Apostle Paul makes it quite clear that now God makes no distinction between peoples and individuals in the church. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Colossians 3.11, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So these verses apply to the unity of the church, but I think they also shed some light on the hope, hopefulness of the gospel for all of us who have fallen short of the glory of God. You see, everyone, at one time or another, believes or at least hopes that they have a, a righteousness of their own apart from salvation in Christ. They hope that their self-defined righteousness will qualify them somehow to get into heaven, but that's a hopeless belief. That's a hopeless hope. So using information I gathered from various Bible dictionaries, I've put together a description for what I think each people group that Paul mentions in these verses to the Galatians and the Colossians, a description for what I think each of these groups, these people groups believe to be the proof of their righteousness. And then I've compared that to what I think people believe today. In Galatians and Colossians, Paul talked about the Jews who hypocritically considered that their bloodline alone made them righteous. And the Greeks, who probably thought they were righteous because in their pride, they believed that they had built the world's most advanced and sophisticated society. And the barbarians and Scythians, who most likely thought that just their brutal strength and might made them righteous, might makes right. The men of Rome, who in all likelihood considered righteousness and Roman citizenship to be the same thing. The women of Rome, who were denied many privileges of that citizenship, and may have thought that their long suffering under this injustice gained for them a kind of righteousness and the slaves of Rome, who were considered to be nothing more than just somebody's property, possibly felt that only those who were as oppressed as they were could be genuinely righteous. So in summary, some thought they were righteous just by right of birth. Some thought that their advanced, sophisticated culture proved that they were righteous. Others thought that their citizenship in a great and powerful country meant that they were righteous. Or some thought that they must be considered to be righteous because they were excluded and downtrodden and oppressed. But the Apostle Paul said there's no distinction. And he went on to say that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how does that compare with today? No change. Everybody needs the Savior. 
Being born into a Christian family, being baptized as an infant, that won't save you. Being knowledgeable and clever and talented, being successful in your career, that won't save you. Being born and raised in a so-called Christian nation, that won't save you. Being painfully different from everyone else, being looked down upon, being ostracized and oppressed, that doesn't make you sinless. That won't save you. Only Christ can save you. He lived the life that we should have lived, and he died the death that we should have died. We're hopeless tryhards, aren't we? Always fall short of the glory and perfection of God, and we cannot in any way claim or earn a righteousness of our own. Christ lived and died on our behalf. That's what saves you and me. Christ's life of perfection was acceptable to God, and he gifted that righteousness to all who believe in him, all who believe on his name. To them he gives the right to become the children of God. And Christ's sacrifice of himself on the cross in the place of you and me was perfect and acceptable to God to atone for our sins. Now there's no record of wrongs held against us. That's what saves you and me. And taking all of this into consideration, the apostle went on to say in his letters to the churches at Galatia and Colossae that there's no distinctions in Christ whatsoever. He said, you're all one in Christ. So in the church, we should not look to distinctions to make much of them. We shouldn't look at distinctions like language and culture and gender and qualifications and so on to make much of those. We should look to Christ and make much of Christ and be one in Christ. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And with his blood he bought her, and for her life he died. So we're all one in Christ. There's no distinction. So let's make much of him. Amen. Amen.